a big big hello to everyone and uh, yeah welcome to this first in a three-part series of webinars dedicated to exploring the notion of social value in the circular economy my name is michael len i'm the director of the international social and circular enterprise network reuse and together with my colleague kelly we'll be guiding th you through today's conversation with a fantastic author and journalist adam minter Adam, it's an absolute honor to have you with us here today. So thanks a lot for your time. My honor as well. Fantastic. Um, before we jump into our conversation, just a couple of practical aspects. And I wanted to maybe go through a little bit of the context as why we gathered here today. Just as my colleague Kelly mentioned, this, uh, this discussion is being recorded uh, for note taking purposes, summarizing of key messages, some snippets of good quotes, and we may well uh, make it available later on uh, on YouTube, with of course the permission of Adam. Uh, we are using Zoom webinars today, so we're really trying to encourage this conversation to be as engaging as possible. And as a participant, you have two key tools at your disposal. You have the chat function and you have the question and answer function. For the chat, please feel free to say hello, just like Janet just did. React to anything you hear, post interesting relevant articles, you know, we want to really create an informal yet informative uh, atmosphere here for this conversation. Um, and if you have any specific questions which you would like to pose to Adam, please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen within Zoom. And Kelly will summarize the questions at the end and pose them through to Adam. So that's more or less the practical aspects from the why we are here, why we are gathered here today. Um, the circular economy is really a key pillar to Europe's regenerative industrial strategy, especially in the face of the ongoing pandemic. Circular economy is enshrined within the Green Deal. It's supported within the EU budget. There's a whole host of policies coming our way as a result of the new EU circular economy action plan. So we've got everything coming our way from an EU strategy on sustainable textiles to a circular electronics initiative to an EU product policy initiative. The list goes on. And I think it's fantastic. And that circular ball is really, really rolling at the moment. And that's that's really, really great. But when we're involved in the political discussions and the policy discussions that are ha happening here, it's we find that it's often still based on on technical solutions, on, on resource efficiencies, on improvements in manufacturing processes on, on greener products with higher recycled content. And all of these things, I think, are important components of the circular economy. But there's little discussion on that social dimension of the circular economy. And, and it somehow goes under the radar. And as indeed our conversations about activities that can really support different and additional forms of social value, such as reuse and repair, something that we'll be discussing today. For us as a network, as reuse, social value is definitely about people we're an international network that is celebrating 20 years of existence this year our network are based of social enterprises which provide job and training opportunities for those most vulnerable in our society through the activities of reuse repair and recycling they also ensure that their their services and also their products are accessible to people individuals families of all income levels so i think for us as an organization as reuse we have a strong idea of how we contribute to social value it's about jobs it's about skills it's about inclusion it's about justice but then again what we understand about social value is different to what other people understand about social value particularly in the context of the circular economy so if we want to place emphasis on policies on political strategies on activities which really foster a major change in our society and a major support to people we need to be open about what to look for when talking about social value and that is precisely the reason why we have organized this three-part conversation series that adam today is going to be taking part in now, to test this kind of hypothesis about the fact that social and social value means something different to everyone, um, in the chat you will very you'll find very soon a link asking you, the audience, to post down in two words what social value in the circular economy means to you, and it would just be nice to see kind of what the kind of feeling is in the room concerning social value in the circular economy. And you will see on your screen 
that Kelly will share what you're all thinking at this moment in time. So click on the link in the chat and write down a few examples of what comes into your mind in two words about what social value in a circular economy means. We have 45 seconds or a minute to see what, see, see what you, you think. Got some coming in now, job creation, inclusion. Can't see link in the chat. Do you want to quickly repost the link in the chat, Kelly? Sorry about that, Carrie. Carrie, welcome from Australia. Fantastic to have you with us. There's the link in the chat. And hopefully that opens up a little menti. Hopefully you can see the link there, Felipe and Carla. In any case, we'll send, spend another 45 seconds and we'll jump into the conversation. If it, uh, fantastic. Here we go. <laughs> Fairness, cohesion, resilience, sustainability, human. Wow. Community building. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, for all of your input, uh, everyone. I think that's it's really, really fantastic to see how the different forms, what words really try and describe social value in a circular economy to you. And I think we'll jump upon those words together with Adam in our conversation. So, Adam, I'm going to be turning to you now. You are a Bloomberg journalist and columnist and author of fantastic books, including Junkyard Planet and most recently Secondhand, both of which I have here, both of which I have had a fantastic time uh, reading. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just at the beginning to set the scene a little bit, Tell us a little bit about your connection with mm -hmm. the, the world of waste and, and maybe a little bit about what encouraged you to to write your book uh, second hand, sure. your latest book. It'd be fantastic. Sure, sure. Well, uh, for me, it's it's genetic. Um, you know, it's in the blood, uh, maybe quite literally. Um, I come uh, from a long line of scrap peddlers uh, here in the United States. It dates back to the beginning of the 20th century uh, when my great grandfather, Abe Leader, uh, left Russia really as a refugee, um, sailed to the United States. He did not speak English. He did not have any meaningful skills. Um, and he landed in Galveston, Texas and needed work. And he did what a lot of people around the world did before him and continue to do today. He sort of went searching out that entrepreneurial opportunity of last resort. He literally picked rags off the streets of Galveston, Texas. Um, and you know that starts out by picking up the rags, putting them in a backpack. Maybe you get a barrow, push them along. Maybe you get a horse drawn cart. All of these things he did um, to eventually making his way up to Minneapolis and having a small scrapyard. And that ethic of collecting and finding value in what others consider waste, you know, continues, um, you know, in my family to this day. I was very close to my grandmother who ran a thrift shop uh, in Minneapolis uh, for many years. Um, and so that made an impression as well. Um, you know, and, and again, as I say, it's it's in the blood. Who knows what I was uh, breathing in that scrapyard uh, as, as a toddler, uh, because some of my earliest memories are actually in there. And so when I transitioned to journalism, because one thing I learned was um, I may have grown up around it, but I, I didn't necessarily have the business talent to do it. So I, I, I transitioned to journalism, but you know, you never entirely escape, you know, those family roots. And um, and I found myself writing about it and being interested in it. And and you know, necessarily I, I wrote about the environmental side of recycling, but you know, my whole family history is really proof of the social value. 
of reuse and recycling. It is what has fed us, what has educated us, what has housed us. And that's been very important to me. And as I, as, um, you know, as I started thinking about the next book after Junkyard Planet, I really wanted to talk about reuse, but I also wanted to, to bring in some of that social value and show how, um, in particular, immigrants and, and people looking for that opportunity to employ themselves and, and, and raise up their status within society um, were able to do that through these enterprises. Well, thanks. Uh, that's fantastic, Adam. And I guess, I mean, certainly within, within, your, within both books and in general in, in your personal life, you have really traveled the globe and have had incredible conversations whilst really trying to understand the flows of our materials, mm -hmm. what's happening with our products uh, across the globe and our attitudes towards mm -hmm. uh, consumption, so on and so forth. You've had countless conversations with representatives from social enterprises working with reuse in the, with the private sector, with informal actors. You've really had a, I would say, a, a truly broad um broad set of discussions there and written their stories so eloquently in your books would you be able to go into a little bit um about your thoughts regarding where the points regarding social value exist in the circular economy from your from your travels sure sure well let me you know the, the there were a few starting points for secondhand um and because that's when i really started thinking if you would formally about this subject, you know, I sort of always knew it was in the back of my head. But but one of the starting points uh, for secondhand was almost a decade ago. I was in Austin, Texas, actually reporting a recycling story um, about how Dell uh, collected uh, used electronic equipment from Goodwill um, and handled the proper recycling of that equipment for for Goodwill. And so I, I visited a uh, the headquarters of the Goodwill of Central. Uh, Texas, I believe is the name of the Goodwill Federation down there. And they gave me a tour where they collect everything. And, and then they said, would you, or would you be interested in seeing our outlet? And I'm, I'm, I'm very gullible. I actually thought, you know, I'm looking at electronics. I think they're talking about an electrical outlet, you know, and I said, it's a very strange question. And they said, no, no, the actual retail outlet has, it. Ah, yes, you know. Um, and so you can see why I'm not in the business. I'm, I'm writing about it. I'm slow. Um, and so they took me into this room where there were carts of stuff, mostly textiles that were, uh, and they looked almost like gurneys that you would put bodies on. And uh, only it was piled with textiles. And these textiles were in a circle in this very large room. And they were sort of moving through the room every 15 minutes, they would come in, and they would move out. And there would be people um, who literally pounced upon them. And, and uh, in the room, mostly what I heard was Spanish. And as it was explained to me is that this is the stuff that didn't sell in the other parts of the good other Goodwill retail outlets. So it was then sold by the pound here. And most of the people who were actually there to pick that stuff off those gurneys, um, these carts, were traders from Mexico who drive up every day and spend their day their days in this room watching as this excess inventory comes and they collect it. And if you go out to the parking lot, you would see vans and cars stuffed with the stuff to be brought back down to Mexico, sorted and sold in retail outlets there. And for me, I, I, it's, it was a very important moment because I suddenly realized that these very large thrift outlets had the potential to be sort of entrepreneurial incubators. You know, we always hear in the US at least, people talk about business incubators. We need technology incubators, you know, places where we can help support uh, the development of you know, software developers or, or biotechnologists. And as I stood there and maybe I, you know, I was sort of wearing my Bloomberg hat, I said, oh my gosh, you know, this is a secondhand incubator. In a sense, this, this thrift and its outlet is incubating and supporting all of these, these businesses over the border in Mexico. And, you know, and I remember talking to my wife later in the day, I said, there's something to this. And I think, and I think I should write about it. And, and for me, that was really the beginning. And, and that incubator, if you will, that Goodwill outlet. And I, you know, I don't know if, if Goodwill's ever thought of them as secondhand incubators, but I certainly did, at least down on the border there, really led to me a few years years later, spending time in Arizona with businesses that, that use these outlets and use these thrift stores to, to trade into Mexico. So for me, that was a really important moment, this idea that these, these, these large thrifts, secondhand businesses, 
and developed countries could serve as business incubators for others. Um, the other big moment for me in, in looking at this was actually in Tamale, uh, which is the capital of the Northern region of Ghana, where I spent a significant amount of time uh, a few years ago. Um, I wanted to spend time in a place where there's a lot of secondhand. And, um, and Ghana and West Africa is a place where there's a lot of secondhand. I wanted to go to a town where there wasn't a lot of new stuff and, and Tamale uh, was that place. And there's a, we could talk, I probably will talk a lot about Tamale later, but, but there was a moment in Tamale that was very important to me. And that was, I was spending time at a computer repair business called Chindiba Enterprises. Um, and they are the largest um, repair center and also retailer in Tamale, which is a city, I believe, about 50,000 people. It's all secondhand stuff, all imported. And, um, and one of the techs there, a brilliant young man, um, uh, he's not included in the books, so I won't use his name here, but about 20 years old at the time. And I asked him, how did you get into this? And he said, well, I went to the local uh, uh, I went to the local technical university and my dream was to become an engineer in a factory. Um, but there's not a lot of uh, manufacturing development in Ghana for all kinds of reasons, which we don't need to go into here. Um, um, and the few factories that are there, as he told me at the time, he says, you know, being an engineer in a factory is, is a rich man's son's job, which I thought was very striking. And I said, well, you're not a rich man's son. He says, no. So he said, I had to get a job. He had this technical background. And so in part, he, he taught himself and in part, he was trained by other people who know how to repair computers to be a master computer repairman. And when I say master, the things that can be done with a computer in Tamale, you are not going to be able to find a computer repair shop in Brussels that does the sort of things they do. I, one of the things I did uh, when I went to Tamale, because I had heard all this talk about Tamale's repair people, I brought the laptop that I wrote Junkyard Planet on, and it had failed. And uh, I couldn't figure out why. It wasn't the, um, the hard drive. And so I brought it, I brought it with me. And in Chandiba, um, they not only tore it down, they went down to the board and they figured out the chip that was malfunctioning. Instead of replacing the chip, they basically repaired the chip, um, you know, right there. Find me somebody in Brussels or in Minneapolis who will do that. They won't. And yet they have the skills to do that relatively quickly. And, you know, if they had a whole line of them uh, with some frequency in Tamale. So it made a huge impression upon me that this is a source of employment um, for people who wouldn't have other opportunities. I don't know what these young men who, you know, uh, graduated from Tamales Technical University would do if they didn't have this opportunity within repair and reuse. Fantastic. Um, so many thoughts running through through my mind concerning those those two points which you mentioned. I think if I'm not, um, well, if I take the first, the, the your second example first, and then and then the first one maybe to explore it a little bit more. The idea of skills and training in repair. One of the stories which struck me, I believe it's from Tamale, was from uh, your, your, your friend or a colleague who, who you met there, Ibrahim Hassan, mm -hmm. um, who was repairing, is repairing televisions in Ghana. And one of the quotes which you, which you had was concerning the fact that his friends used to gather around him to watch him repair things because they were in awe about what he was doing. And I just, that kind of struck me as, is there learnings to be had in Western Europe regarding this, um, I would say, to make repair great again and to really show that it's really skillful and something right. which is really worthwhile doing and bringing back that repair culture? Is that yeah. something which is... Well, I, I'm so glad you bring up Ibrahim al Uh That's in the town of Savalugu, which is, I want to say, about 15 miles from Tamale, which is in some ways a very long way. And it's, it's, a, it's a town, um, you know, that doesn't have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of wealth in it. Um, and, uh, and it's a very social place. And, and you know, the, it's exactly what you described. I mean, if when I first met him, he's on this dirt road in Savalugo in front of his home, um, repairing televisions beneath this canopy, and people are standing around watching him. You know, because he's just so, uh, first of all, I think there's maybe, you know, I mean, people have televisions there, but this is good entertainment and he's so skilled and it's sort of like, oh, so somebody brought that in. Let's see what you can do, buddy. You know, and, and uh, I describe, uh, you know, in the book that he was brought in a broken television. He says, well, how about I add a remote control for it? 
you know, as well. Because it, it was a 30, 40 year old television that was a manual switch. Who has a manual switch television? But those are still in circulation and use in, in that part of Ghana. And he said, well, let me do a favor and we'll, we'll add some remote control, um, you know, capability to it, which is an incredible thing to do. Now, I, you know, I'm biased. I mean, I'll sit there and watch him all day. You know, I think that's great entertainment. <laughs> That's the nature of who I am, um, you know, but but so were his neighbors. And, and I think there is something heroic about that. And I can say, you know, one of the fun parts of writing a book is you do get feedback and especially a book like this with people saying, you know, my dad used to do that. You know, my grandfather used to, it's usually men that will refer to doing that kind of stuff. Uh, frankly, they don't often, I don't get notes saying my mom used to repair the television, you know, which I think is a very interesting topic. And there is a lot of gendering that goes on within repair as well. But, but the broader point is people have really good memories of it. It's something um, that generates these really great feelings. And you know, you're not the first person to ask me about Ibrahim al-Hassan. I've had people ask me very technical questions and I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you, um, but they're fascinated. They wanna watch him. You know, how deep does that go? I don't know, a cable television series about you know, repair cafes. I've, I, this is, you know, I, I would pitch this, somebody should pitch this. Janet, you should pitch this. Um, you know, go to one of the cable networks and say, let's do, let's do a, a show about repair cafes and yeah, Netflix and, and, you know, and people bring in whatever random thing and, and challenge the repair folks to uh, fix it. You know, I think, I think there's an element, I don't know how mainstream it'd be, but I think it's mainstream enough where you could put it on a cable channel and at 10 PM in the evening, um, you know, people would watch it. So I think there is something to that. There is this heroic narrative and people really get into it. And I'll say this, actually, I bet Janet knows this. And I'm only referring, I'm referring to Janet because I really admire what she does. But I also, I, you know, we know each other digitally. But, um, you know, Janet will know this as well as anybody. There are on YouTube, you know, there's a whole niche. I don't even know if it's a niche anymore of videos of people repairing things. My son likes to watch it. You know, they're going to, you know, fix everything from an old rusty ladder to, you know, how to, how to plop a new transmission into your automobile. And if you look at these videos, there's thousands and thousands of people watching these based upon the YouTube counts. Fantastic. I mean, definitely. I think there's, there's, there's certainly, certainly ways to, to start encouraging us to look at repair quite differently. I, I, I guess can I say, can I say one thing about that? And, and I think, I mean, I, look, I am, I am a very committed environmentalist and conservationist. And I think, let me just say, I think the environmental side of this is extremely, extremely important. Um, I, it should never be underestimated. But I have found that, you know, when I've talked to policymakers and other journalists, I said, if you want to bring people into these movements, if you will, I don't know necessarily, I have found in my own work and what people respond to in my work, it's not the environmental arguments. It is that very human argument saying, look at this person repairing this television. And people respond to that by saying, yeah, I wish I could still do that or have somebody I could take that to. And I think that there is, uh, there's a heuristic there, you know, that's that's very valuable, and it's a way to get people more engaged with the wider topic of circularity as an environmental theme. Is is to really emphasize it. I mean, on the on the note of of repair, one of the things which you've mentioned within your book uh, concerns the fact that our you know linear economy and and mass production has somehow eroded the need uh, and the skills amongst our society, certainly in the West, to, to repair so we replace mm -hmm. rather than repair or, or, or reuse. How would you see, what would be the top one or two things that you would like to see to bring back a strong repair culture to, to Western Europe? What so, do you think needs to be done here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it has to go beyond thinking about just repair. I think ultimately, it requires a shift in thinking about um, products themselves and the durability of products. And, and one of the things I, I talk about quite a bit, I touch on it in the book, but I, I like the idea of durability labeling you know, which is the idea that you buy something and there's a label on it that tells you how long it's going to last. Um, and I know that there has been some work done on this um, in Europe, you know, testing to see if consumers respond to that. You put a label, you know, on, a, you know, really clear label on, on an appliance saying this one is going to last X number of years. And the other one says it'll last this number of years. And consumers have shown a willingness to spend a little bit more to buy that more durable product. Um, 
you know, to me, that drives the need for repair because if people are buying something saying it's more durable, they're they're probably going to be willing to to take the steps necessary to keep it going. I I, I always think of this, you know, in terms of used cars and new cars. Um, you know, uh, when I have bought a car. Um, I buy used cars, uh, but when I buy that car, I'm very, and, and this is not just me, I'm very interested in what the potential resale value is. And you can go online, um, you know, in the States, we have what's called the Kelly Blue Book, which is a, is a, a, a resource that tells you, you know, how, how quickly its value will decline. What is uh, a 2014 Toyota Corolla will likely be worth, you know, and, and what it'll be worth in 2016 and 2018. And when you have that kind of information, I think it drives people, and the evidence shows this, to think more in terms of maintaining their stuff. And so we know people do it with cars. We know people do it with appliances. And, and I think, um, and I haven't seen any data on it, but I, I suspect they are starting to think in those terms with textiles too, because you are starting to see more marketing of textiles, at least higher end brands, especially outdoor brands, um, talking about their durability and also um, framing that in terms of, you know, there's things you can do to maintain them. So I really think it's, 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 it is a discussion of repair, but I think in terms of getting consumers to think that way, I think we have to be getting them to think about durability of products and that will drive nudge, however you want to put it, into repair. Okay, great. No, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Sometimes we think about this idea of, of, of durability, better quality products as, as being often something which can become a little bit more expensive and can often uh push push it past a price point where it's actually Absolutely. accessible to to the wide masses and i think maybe that's a conversation that we can have in in, in the discussion about the accessibility of circular mm -hmm. products for the for, right. for the future but um well let me I just say something about that because i'm very concerned about that as well and and there is definitely the case that with a lot of circular products right now um durable products however you want to put it um there's a certain privilege to that, you know, and there's also there's there, there tends to be a class element to who can afford those, and 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 I think that's a problem. But I think uh, it's a problem that solves itself in two ways um, over time. One, I mean, if they are circular, they will enter the wider secondhand economy, and the overall cost of them should decline, making them more accessible. That's sort of how it works. And 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 the other thing is, is that as demand increases for those, I mean, everybody wants a durable product. Hopefully, the wonders of mass production can find ways to you know economies of scale make those durable products more accessible. And, 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 and I think there's evidence that that, that has happened and, and hopefully it will continue to, but it's a long-term process. And I think it's something we sh all should be concerned about. We're concerned about social value. Okay, fantastic. Um, maybe jumping back to your first, uh, your first example of, mm -hmm. of Goodwill, would it be possible for you, um, you to explain to the audience, because we have quite an international audience, what yeah. a kind of organization like Goodwill does and and maybe its place in the secondhand industry within within the U.S. Uh, okay. I think it would be good to give some 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 context. Uh, okay. to that. I'm, I'm I'm now nervous because I know there's at least one person from Goodwill. Oh, sorry. On the call. Shout out to those working. <laughs> yeah. More or less uh, yeah. Well, no. Uh, Goodwill is the largest uh, thrift in the United States, and it is um, the largest uh, source. Uh, by source, I mean uh, it's the largest depot for people dropping off their secondhand items. Um, it's a donation base charity um, and they cycle through I wish I'd uh, pulled up the number of how much volume they bring but it's an enormous amount and and I did the calculation I was working on secondhand I believe roughly five percent of the secondhand stuff in the United States that enters a secondhand economy runs through goodwill which is an enormous enormous number but it also tells you how diffuse uh, U.S. secondhand is um, it's a donation-based charity over a century old the donations um, are used to finance um good works, charitable works. In the case of Goodwill, um, the mission is usually, um, you know, job training and making people employable and helping them get into the workforce, which I think is a tremendous, um, uh, you know, use of the revenues that come from uh, uh, those items that are donated. And they have wonderful programs. I spent quite a, a bit of uh, 
time in the Arizona one, Southern Arizona Goodwill Federation, and they help uh, you know uh, you know kids who dropped out of school get their uh, what's called a GED. If for folks who aren't in the United States, a GED is just uh, what's called a graduate equivalency degree. That's a high school degree. You know they will help place them uh, with employers, and if they are you know uh, somebody who hasn't worked before, they may even subsidize the salary to convince an employer to take them on and get them working. And so even though they're not employing people in second hand, they're using that second hand economy to help people find employment. And I think it's, it's a really um, terrific model. Um, I believe there's 140 federations in North America and thousands of stores. So, so it's really quite big um, and they're quite innovative um, in terms of their pricing and how they uh, segregate uh, different kinds of materials that are brought into the stores. They even have boutiques now. So instead of throwing everything out onto the thrift store floor, you might uh, have something at a slightly higher price point. So again, they can extract that value from it and use it for what they do. Okay, fantastic. And maybe moving into this world of attitudes towards secondhand, you mentioned mm -hmm. there were flocks of people coming to the Goodwill in, in, uh, in, in, in Arizona. Was it Arizona? Oh, no. Southern Arizona, yeah. Tucson. Southern Arizona. Tucson. Yeah. Um, in order to be able to uh, take certain uh, items which could be uh, interesting for the Mexican market, I can imagine there's mm -hmm. also a strong local uh, reuse, a local thr uh, thrift uh, market as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe could you tell us a, a little bit about the, the, the different differing attitudes towards buying secondhand that you've you've come across are there different parts of the population more willing to buy secondhand are there certain obstacles that we mm -hmm. need to look at when thinking about trying to mainstream secondhand from a from a behavioral perspective sure, um, sure. i should I say i just saw uh, the the goodwill employee I, I i know from online steven sutterby he just mentioned goodwill also sells online they do and that's a, a growing growing very important component of their business and in part it's an answer to your question because um you know online um you know it's an interesting thing uh, you know there has always been, and I know this from my own family, um, there's always been a stigma attached with people who recycle, people who have reusables. Um, it's something that you see less and less of here in North America, and I think in Europe. Um, but, you know, I spent 12 years uh, reporting in China. And, um, you know, the idea of using secondhand clothes was a real point of shame. Um, and it was, it's also, there's a lot of different uh, cultural levels to this. It was also considered bad luck. Um, and especially at a time, oh, absolutely, you know, it, dead people's clothes, you know, is something to be called. And so um, what's interesting about that what's happened in China is China has become more and more affluent. You sort of had people back off from secondhand and it's become more and more affluent. And as people have more disposable income, they're actually turning back to it. And so you start to see thriving online marketplaces for secondhand in China used by a middle class that before wouldn't be caught uh, quite literally dead wearing the stuff. Um, so so it's um, you're seeing a shift. And I think that shift in China is happening at a much quicker pace than it happened, say, in North America, um, where you also saw the same thing happen. Who wants to wear secondhand? I grew up in an environment where we knew recycling was something people backed off of. People who wear secondhand clothes, that's for poor people. Um, you know, it's because you can't afford new, it's hand-me-downs. And that's starting to change. And it's driven um, by a couple of things. One, I think we're seeing the mainstreaming of environmentalism, um, thinking about issues like carbon, um, you're also seeing the fashion world drive some of this, you know, and again, it's all part of a whole, you can't separate it out. But what I, what I kept hearing and during the time uh, I spent at Goodwill in Arizona in the Tucson area, you know, uh, store managers would say, you know, increasingly we're getting the BMW crowd, meaning, you know, the BMW crowd pulling up, you know, and going into the store and looking for secondhand fashion, you know, um, and that's, that's really exciting. What's driving it? You know, it's probably not the value mission that used to drive so much of the majority of, of Goodwill's customers. Now it, it is fashion, now it is um, sustainability. And, and, and so you do get that shift and, and the consumer surveys show it as well, especially amongst younger consumers. So it's a really exciting time in North America for these businesses. Fantastic, it just reminded me, and we have in the room our colleague Marina from, from Italy, from a social cooperative in Italy. and. Uh, one of their big success stories has been working with, inadvertently, with social media influencers. 
mm -hmm. um, who have suddenly, you know, seen really the benefits of, of second hand and, and suddenly inspired, uh, in the case of this social cooperative, a whole new generation of young persons coming in and trying on and buying uh, yeah. second hand people who used to not not go there. It's incredible the power of social media that can have over over the younger and, generation. And, and the biggest change, really, I think, um, you know, in the last few years, uh, and this is, I mean, Goodwill actually has a role in this, is the rise of the private marketplaces, the private second hand marketplaces, places like uh, Poshmark, Debop, um, you know, or even to some extent the e base but the but the but the, you have these private marketplaces which are modeled now after um social networks like a Facebook and people go on and they sell each other out of literally their closets. Um, and you see these businesses, Poshmark in, in particular, are now, are now listed on stock exchanges in North America and are worth billions of dollars. When Poshmark debuted, it was a couple months ago, um, now I'm sounding like the Bloomberg journalist, um, you know, it's, uh, its share price more than doubled in a day. Well, who on earth would have guessed that a, a online marketplace devoted to selling, buying and selling used clothes would have that kind of value on a stock exchange. Well, I think actually probably folks at Goodwill sort of saw the possibility. I mean, it, you know, because they, they know just how much material flows through them, but it really is a shift when you can see something like a used clothing retailer, um, you know, getting those kinds of valuations on stock exchanges. It does tell you that there has been a shift in how people approach this stuff. I think I think the landscape in the secondhand industry is changing quite significantly as a yeah. result of this online revolution. Yeah. Um, the online marketplaces is one, but also the investment in new technologies regarding mm -hmm. sorting of goods, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be textiles or others. And this is this use of artificial intelligence, and we've understood from a number of large multinational companies kind of looking at how to improve efficiencies within second hand you know that's coming just around the corner so I, I get the impression that within the next five years there's going to be tremendous change in mm -hmm. the in the second hand uh, second hand market making it more accessible but maybe posing extra questions about where then does the social value lie in in, in your physical shops etc right. and where right. do where will be the donations you know going through for the traditional charitable organizations etc these questions which which we're asking ourselves mm -hmm. um i I have to ask this question because it's 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 a very maybe a very difficult one to ask, but um, uh, maybe it has a very long response. But I do want to also hear from from our colleagues in the in the room and give some time for for questions and answers. Um, well, you mentioned a little bit about you know the importance of mass production of uh, durable products of of better quality goods, the trickle down effect into the second hand market that that will have to to make it more accessible to people. One of the things which we um, flag up as an organisation is, is fundamentally we need to reduce our consumption in the first place and get people buying. Mm -hmm. less or doing you know valuing our products uh, more whether they own them or you know looking into into different ways of of simply doing more with less how how do you think it is possible to tap into a consumer's mind to buy less do you think something needs to be done for example with marketing do you think anything needs to be done i mean would you think it's it's a market that needs to simply evolve to give different forms of services in order to reduce consumption. What's maybe your feeling? So Sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm somewhat cautiously optimistic on this point. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, and, and I'm going to sort of circle back to, to secondhand uh, and I, and, and the book, um, you know, there were, there were a couple routes for that book, but the second sort of major route um, that really got me going was, was the passing of my grandmother and the passing of my mother. And in both cases, uh, they left homes with things, with stuff that, you know, it was my responsibility and the responsibility of my sister, and in the case of my grandmother and my uncle, uh, to figure out what to do with all that stuff. And I, and I opened secondhand talking about this, and it's an overwhelming, extremely depressing process. And I think anybody who lives in a Western affluent society at some point is faced with this very difficult decision of what to do with a deceased partner, family member, friends, um, you know, leftover things that, you know, meant something to them, but doesn't mean anything um, necessarily to you. You know, um, you know, I might, uh, I don't know, this pen might have real sentimental value to me, but if I keel over today, my son is going to come over here and say, okay, we're going to have to throw this away, you know, and you do that writ large 
charged with sofas and with, you know, all kinds of things. And it's a very emotionally distressing process. And it's, it's given rise to an entire industry. Um, I just spoke to a colleague the other day who was going through this and he was asking advice from me. And I said, I, you know, I, I, I don't really give advice. I said, if you need advice, you should probably hire a clean health professional. But I think that process um, because in the United States, especially, it's going to be happening a lot more as the baby boomer generation ages and their children are going to have this very shocking, very emotional, um, very hard uh, process they're all going to go through in cleaning out these things. And as I talk to people, as I hear from people, the, the number one email I get from people who read secondhand is, I just went through this with my mother. I just went through this with my father. I am not going to do this to my kids you know? And so, and I hear that over and over. That's the number one response to the book is I'm not going to accumulate like my parents did. And, you know, I have no way of measuring this, but I, I, I suspect just the way we're seeing some consumer trends move that maybe there is a kind of, we've reached a peak stuff, at least with, you know, in a certain context that will get people to think more seriously about their things. I, I just know it from the number of people who respond to my book. Now, of course, those are people who are buying a book called Secondhand, but that's a start. So I'm, I'm optimistic in that sense. I'm also optimistic in the sense that you see a younger generation, um, you know, millennials and Generation Z, I get mixed up with all of these various labels for these generations, um, but stating very clearly that they want more sustainable consumption. And if that, if they are sincere about that, and I think some of it's oversold a little bit, they're going to be more open to durable products. And initially, at least, that's going to be more expensive products. And that means they're going to be buying less. Um, I am firmly of the belief that you can't lecture people into buying less stuff. Um, you know, you know, if you lecture people, I think they buy more stuff. Um, you know, it's just how they are. I think to a certain extent, you have to sort of nudge them along and show them gently the impact of, 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 the, of what the impact of their consumption. And that may very well be, I think, the emotional impact. I think that clean out process really does um, make, make an impression upon people. And I think those kinds of things are what will get people there. But, but, but I, I, I really firmly believe it's not that I'm against this. Don't misinterpret me. I don't think lecturing people about the carbon impact of their consumption, the vast majority of the population is just not going to react to that. I think you really do need to hit people more emotionally and practically. That's very, that's very clear. Thank you, uh, thank you, Adam, for for, for that. What I thought was going to be a very, uh, you know, lengthy, uh, lengthy answer to such a massive question. But thank you. Um, well, uh, I guess one last point you've on this same theme. Regarding policies, we also we we work a lot uh, regarding uh, EU policy, and you just mentioned a little bit about how you know to tackle a repair culture. You've mentioned the importance of of labeling as one intervention, which a policymaker could do to encourage a mm. um, I would say an attitude towards towards buying better, more repairable uh, products. Would there be any other? Yeah. Any but, other? So policy points, which for you are very important that uh, maybe some which are missing. Which... Yeah, well, I think I think it's it's both specific and more general. I think, you know, the way we talk about waste, um, you know, in developed countries um, needs to change a little bit. Um, you know, one of the reasons why things don't get repaired is because somebody else has labeled them as waste and saying, well, it's waste. Uh, it can't be repaired. And then the next level is it shouldn't be repaired. And we see this um, to some extent with electronics in the Basel Treaty, where Europe says, OK, this computer is broken. It's waste. It shouldn't be exported. But I can tell you, as we discussed earlier, if you go to Tamale, that broken computer in Europe, if you ship it to Tamale, it will be repaired. And so what my suggestion is, and this is both specific and general, is, you know, you don't define waste. The person who throws something away isn't the person who should be deciding whether it's waste. It really should be the person who wants it. If somebody can look at it and say, okay, you may think that's waste, but I know I can fix it. That's the person who should be determining policy. And right now, you know, we really have wealthy developed countries. Also, Japan is involved in this. It's not just Western Europe, Australia, where they're saying, okay, we've decided this computer is waste. It can't go to West Africa or it can't go to Eastern Europe. 
And, and that's a huge mistake. We really need to be thinking more expansively about how we define what is waste. And that means uh, deferring to the people in repair-oriented cultures. And right now, Western Europe isn't a repair-oriented culture, but somebody in Eastern Europe with, with lesser income than somebody in Western Europe certainly is more, gonna be more repair-oriented. And definitely somebody in say Lagos or in Tamale is going to be more, more repair-oriented. Ask them what is waste because what they think is waste is going to be much more narrow than what somebody in Brussels does. And I think policy really needs to adjust to that. And if you do that, if you make more stuff available for repair and stop labeling it as waste, I think we'll see real progress. That's a, that's a waste versus non-waste is an internal discussion that we are having mm -hmm. for, you know, quite seriously. I mean, there are some businesses which have grown up specifically due to that definition of waste mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as a result and are able to um, access reusable goods as a, as a result of that. But at the same time, we understand you know, with the advent of the Basel Convention, waste uh, shipment regulations, so on and so forth, the questions arise concerning conditions that these products are being, um, are being, uh, well, repaired and or recycled, et cetera. There's, that's a huge discussion as well, which it I is. don't necessarily want to go yeah. into I right understand. now. Because that, but it's in part of your book, and I do recommend anyone to read uh, that book because Adam does go into quite a lot of detail regarding his views on the export of reusable goods and what's actually happening and trying to dispel some, some, some myths and put forward some hard truths. So I encourage you to read that. Um, I'm going to turn to the crowd because I want to give some uh, some opportunities here for some for some questions, some reactions. I've seen quite a lot of comments going down in the chat. Kelly, how have we been doing for questions? Or if anybody wishes to ask a question directly to Adam on waste, non-waste, on consumption, maybe more socially oriented. We are trying to focus here on social value and the different facets of social value please do feel free to write them down. Kelly, would you like to summarize any questions that may, may be there or we can yes. carry on? Um, the first one um, that's quite interesting from Carla is she's asking, what do you think about the new repair score in France? So the law that was implemented on the 1st of January and the law against planned obsolescence and how could it inspire other legislations? So I love the repair score. And I think that's exactly what we were talking about earlier, durability. And it just gives, I, I think one of the things that can really promote the repair culture, the reuse culture that we all want is just more transparency um, about the products that we buy. The more we know about the products we buy, um, the, more, the more likely we are to buy the products that last longer. And I think the repair score does just that. You know, Again, I don't think you're gonna see anything change necessarily overnight in France. I don't think people are gonna suddenly say, oh, this, this one, uh, you know, is a seven and this one's a five. I'm not sure people are going to be talking about, you know, which one should I buy? But I think the mere fact that you have something out there, you know, saying there are, you know, reminding people that some products are more repairable than others is the kind of nudge. I, I like talking about nudges that consumers need because ultimately it's just, a, it's about shifting thinking. And so I think it's fantastic. Um, in terms of planned obsolescence laws, um, first off, I, you know, the concept of planned obsolescence is, is a sin to me and it's, it's it's something that I, I, it really frustrates me. On the other hand, I, I've always been um, a little reluctant to, to have laws that outlaw it because it's, I think it's a very hard thing to define. And I've actually spoken to people who are very critical of these laws saying, well, well you might consider planned obsolescence is you know, uh, what not what the product designer might have considered planned obsolescence. And so I, I, I'm not a big fan of those kinds of laws and I'm not a big fan of outlawing things necessarily. I think long-term, the most important thing is to be nudging consumers in the right direction. I think that's far more effective and that's why I love the repair scores. Okay, thanks a lot. That was very, uh, very clear. Um, Michael, if you want to add something, uh, don't hesitate to jump in at any point uh, before I move on. Okay. So the next question is also from Carla, and she asks um, what the difference is between Goodwill outlets and um, Oxfam and other uh, types of, of shops, um, shops. Yeah. Well, I, th let me, uh, Goodwill uh, has, again, I know Stephen Sutterby's on this, it's, I'm, I'm nervous talking about uh, Goodwill when somebody who works for them is there, but I will say um, a Goodwill outlet is um, 
there, Goodwill has different kinds of stores. Um, you know, the, the largest number of its stores are retail stores, which is, you know, no different than what you would see in any other kind of uh, secondhand store anywhere else. What Goodwill has, because they have such a large volume of stuff and they want to see that stuff sell, if something doesn't sell on the shelves of its retail stores after a period of time, they will move it to the outlet where instead of individually priced, it will then be sold by the pound. Um, and so it's a way to move more material to get that revenue from that material. And it is an entirely, usually it's an entirely separate store. That's the, that's how it was in Arizona, uh, in Austin, Texas. And so it's, it's quite, um, it's quite a sophisticated system. So that's what an outlet is. I can't speak to whether Oxfam does something uh, uh, like that, um, you know, but what it does require, and I just see Janet uh, commenting scale, um, you know, Goodwill has the scale to be able to uh, do that. I didn't see the rest of Janet's comment. I only saw the first few words of it, but scale makes a big difference. And if you have these large scale businesses, they can, you know, do that and, 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 and you know, segregate product into different kinds of businesses and, and give it a second shot. It's harder to do, obviously, if you're just a small charity shop with, you know, you know, a thousand square feet in which to sell your stuff. And I should say, I, I can't really speak to Oxfam's model because I just, I haven't spent time with it. Oh, that's right. No problem. Perfect, thank you. Um, one of Carla's questions also asks about the influencers um, that were inspiring to buy secondhand. It was, we were referring to the social, the Cooperativa Sociale Insieme uh, example in Italy. Um, I will respond to this uh, in writing, but uh, I can't recall the name of the, the influencer just now. So just so you know, um, then the, another question um, is, what do you see as the social value of secondhand transactions directly between consumers, like the transaction through Facebook, Marketplace, Craigslist, LetGo, and similar online platforms? So, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a user of Facebook Marketplace, and I think one of the really uh, great things about it is that um, it, it, creates, it creates social bonds and it creates, you know, usually when I grew up, hand-me-downs meant, you know, from, uh, you know, one child to the next. And, and it's, you know, Facebook Marketplace is a marketplace. You aren't handing things down. But again, I, I, I love the idea that you're creating social chains of use. And again, it's just about expanding our notions of, of what ownership is in a good way. You know, when I buy something, when I buy a car, I'm thinking somebody else is probably going to own the secondhand car at some point, or if I were to buy a new car. And I think, again, it's as, as you see um, the accessibility of buying and selling secondhand in these marketplaces, I just, again, I think it nudges people towards this broader idea of durable products that will have multiple owners. And I think it's, it's great. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things I worry about, and um, I think other folks, um, uh, probably on this call worry about is how much of is is this peer to peer, which is what we call it in the states, at least peer to peer selling, impacting the traditional thrifts. How much is it taking away from them? That's going to be a very very big issue. I think it is already a big issue. I mean, I I love the fact that people go into Goodwills and and um, you know buy good stuff, you know, or they go to the outlets and and buy stuff, but. Um, you know, I think you know, Goodwill is thinking very seriously about this, and I know other secondhand businesses are. The peer-to-peer -peer is taking away some of the best stuff out of the marketplace and making it harder for these other thrifts to to um, to, to to make the money that they need to do the things that they do. So, um, and that's probably outside the scope of of the discussion, but but it's a very important question, um, and and one I don't have an answer to other than the fact I know it is eroding some of those uh, some of the revenues. Yeah, just to say, echo that quantity and quality is a is a big discussion also internally. And uh, you know, if you are going to be working in, in in the secondhand trade, how can you ensure that you are receiving uh, good quality goods? Um, mm -hmm. Given given that there are so many alternatives now, also to the consumer to be able to sell their own stuff, to be able to trade it, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you still access that? So we're taking on big quantities, but the the general quality is actually declining. That's also as a result of mass production and the inherent right. issues regarding the the way the product is made. But it is definitely a real issue, and I thanks for raising it because it's definitely something which we're mm -hmm. which we're working on. 
Sorry, Kelly, I know there's still a few questions. Thanks so much for the questions. Fantastic to see there's so much energy. Yeah. In Great the, to see yeah. them coming in. Yeah. Um, so the next one um, asks how we can make, how can we make people feel more proud about repairing, for example, in Cuba or other countries, to ensure that they don't switch to bad practices when they have more possibilities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know that there's necessarily policies per se, you know, as we we're talking earlier, I mean, what I think, I think socially, um, we're starting to see just that pride in repair coming back. I mean, as I said, you know, earlier, and I encourage people to look at it, go on YouTube and just, you know, search for repair and pick any product in your home. And I guarantee you, somebody has got a video on how to fix it. And it's probably been watched by thousands of people. That's why, you know, Janet and I were sort of yeah, joking earlier as she was in the comments, you know, uh, why not a Netflix series about repair cafes where people bring in stuff and challenge the repair folks to, to fix it. I guarantee you people would watch that. And, and I think, again, it, it, it's, it's a, you know, this is starting to come. We're starting to see this happen informally. And I bet you in the next five years, we probably will see some kind of repair oriented show and people will get a real kick out of it. But I, I think it's, I, I almost want to say, you know, follow the currents at this point. I don't think that anybody needs to create new currents. The currents are there and it's coming. It's, it's catch them and, and do things to, 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 to turn repair back into this heroic activity that it always kind of was. Thank you. Oh, cool. I thought you were going to say something. Um, the next question is from Janet. Um, she asks, why is there so little data collected and available on the social value of reuse and repair? And there's a sub question to this. Why are these jobs overlooked in the discussion about the green recovery that seems only about transport, energy, and housing? And this question, thank you, Janet, is spot on. Um, thank you, Janet. Yes. <laughs> I, this is this is a really, really important question. Um, you know, I, there's there's many levels uh, at which we could consider this, but let me talk about it in a developing country context and in the context of a country like Ghana or Nigeria. Um, these are developing countries, and by that uh, we mean that their economies haven't reached the standards, whatever those standards are, of wealthier countries. Um, if you are a Ghanaian or a Nigerian policymaker um, and you are appealing for loans, whether it be from private lenders or the World Bank, um, they are not interested in hearing about how many secondhand businesses line the high streets in Accra or in Lagos or in Tamale. That's not interesting. What they want to know is how many factories do you have? How many H&M outlets you have? How many new stereo shops you have? You know, how many Apple, obviously there's not gonna be Apple stores, but you know, stores selling new Android phones. Those are the economic indicators that matter to international, international, um, you know, lenders um, and development agencies. And until those agencies go to a place like Tamale, uh, you know, which we've talked about a little bit. You go to Tamale, and one of the reasons I, I enjoyed spending time in Tamale is if you walk down the main streets of Tamale or go into any of the alleys, 90, 95% of the businesses there are secondhand retail, primarily selling stuff that was uh, purchased in Europe and brought to Tamale. But there's nobody's going there and saying, oh, this is what we should measure. This is how people are starting businesses. They're going to look at the 5% of businesses that are selling you know, new appliances, oftentimes quite low quality ones. Um, they aren't out there. They don't even know how to measure you know, what a secondhand economy means, how to measure growth in a secondhand economy. I've spoken to um, you know, economists at Bloomberg and some of my colleagues. I say, how do you measure this? And they say, well, it's measured as retail. And I said, but it's not, you know, it's not the same same retail and ultimately it doesn't you know bring in investors and they, uh, their answer is yes well we need to be able to start measuring that stuff in a better way and view it as contributing to economic uh, growth and and right now it's just not what's valued what's valued in terms of economic statistics and and we are all defined in our lives by economic statistics is new so that would be that would be my answer, and and that's in an emerging market context. But I think it carries over. I think in very obvious ways to 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 wealthier places, you know, like Western Europe, North America, Japan. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I I think regarding data in general within reuse and repair, one thing which we recently did as an organization is publish a little report into insights in terms of 
you know, how many jobs are created in different types of reuse activities that are quite prevalent mm-hmm. within our network because when looking at the policies underlying the circular economy you look at the impact assessments there's still i would say um quite a limited um data uh, yeah. data set that's underlying those predictions as to what will be the actual job implications of the circular economy and mm-hmm. and this we're just talking about jobs no not even talking about what type of jobs mm-hmm. the people involved um the, the value of the, the the wider intangible benefits of uh, of uh, the, the 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 second hand sector that exists so um europe is moving towards uh, trying to gather more data regarding reuse. So out of some legislation which came out recently um, as part of the European Waste Framework Directive, it's it's important now for member states to uh, monitor reuse activities from qualitative and quantitative mm-hmm. um, means, both through um, means of uh, general uh, questionnaires to different types of reuse operators through to other forms of databases and data sets. So I think Europe is moving towards more quantification of mm-hmm. reuse, but I think what's very important to know is as part of that quantification, what is the impact actually yeah. on the actors themselves by providing more data? Do they have anything in return as a result of giving right. that data? You know, this this means new processes. This means you know possibly mm-hmm. different forms of standards, so on and so forth. There's big yeah. questions to to be asked about that world of data, but certainly the just as a summary within europe at least we are moving towards gathering more data and hopefully more targets re- related to reuse That's beyond great. recycling to to push us towards you know yeah. thinking more so. we have to start measuring the right things and you know i know in north america in the united states i mean one of the, uh, you know there's no i would love to know how many sofas are thrown away in the united states every year or, or go on the second hand market you know that data point doesn't exist and that's going to require um, you know, a huge shift in, in, in probably a, a huge hiring and st- statisticians at economic agency. But, it, and I don't expect that to happen anytime soon, but it does, it does highlight the fact that we, we do need to start measuring the right things. And, and what I did find when I was, I, you know, I didn't expect to find the number of sofas, you know, uh, let go every year, but um, I thought there might be some number out there just giving, as I was writing secondhand, giving some idea. And, and I was sort of disheartened to see that the only number I could find in terms of furniture was waste. You know, how much is, it was defined as waste, you know? And so if you do that, you know, a furniture, you know, furniture is just defined as waste when it isn't wanted by its original owner anymore. It has all kinds of negative implications, um, you know, on social value and, and every other kind of value. Okay, excellent. Thank Great. you. Um, I think we might want to slowly start um, closing the session, but there are three questions um, that have come in that I think are are nice to raise the oh, first if it's okay for the for the if it's okay for adam i don't know what... yeah i've got another i can go for another five ten minutes at tops and then i gotta okay. shift over to something else yeah. so, great minutes, thank you minutes and then we'll... yeah um so one of the questions is if there are any good examples of uh systematizing the skills related to assessing the potential value of discarded materials and um there's a professional training of agents uh Valoriste in Nantes. I have redirected the um, the um, participant to our video um, of ressources, but if you have any um, good examples of that, uh, Adam, it would be great to hear maybe from the from the U.S. perspective. Uh, boy, you know I, that one I wasn't expecting. You know uh, the answer is I don't off the top of my head, but okay. I bet you there is. Uh, I see Robin Ingenthron uh, putting up a link. Maybe that's one. I, it, you know, I'm guessing there's people in the chat who know the answer to that question better than I do. <laughs> well, if anyone wants to respond in the chat, uh, feel free to do so. Um, another question is: How does the full cost of accounting externalities life cycle cost assessment fit into this conversation? I think it's very important. I think we're only at the beginning of that discussion. I mean, you know, people are still figuring out 
um, you know, how to standardize the life cycle assessment process. I mean, that's a huge debate right now. What is the, what is the life cycle of a product? How do you measure it? What should be measured? Um, but I think, I think it's very important, especially from the manufacturer standpoint, because there's a lot of manufacturers of consumer goods right now who are making some very expansive promises about carbon in particular. Um, and to meet those carbon goals, uh, you know, they're going to have to justify the externalities. Uh, and that's just one example. So uh, I think it's very important. And I think we're just at the beginning of the debate. But like a lot of things, I'm cautiously optimistic in part, because I think a lot of manufacturers, charitably speaking, have, have you know, they, they, well, this is maybe not the nicest way, but they've cornered themselves into having to do something. And I, I think that's a good thing. Great, thank you. Um, and the last question um, is in terms of uh, viability of reuse centers, do you think it's more strategic to focus on one kind, on one type of goods, so textiles or electronics, or uh, on a more heterogeneous uh, market? Yeah, that's a great question. I was just talking to somebody about this. My own feeling is that um, I think the stuff, I think the product should be segregated. I, I just think right now, um, just as you would with new product. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have an electronics uh, store in the middle of an H&M. You know, you wouldn't, Apple wouldn't put an Apple store in the middle of an H&M. And, and, you know, and I, I bet we are probably moving towards that model in secondhand as it's more mainstreamed in, in wealthier countries and wealthier regions. And so that you will see, um, you know, if not, you know, outright, you know, used electronic store, used apparel store, used furniture store, that they will start to look more like traditional department stores. Um, and, you know, and you're seeing this in North America with, you know, the traditional thrifts. I mean, the, the Goodwill boutiques are a great example of this, where they, um, where they have elected to say, okay, we're going to take some of this better apparel and put it into a separate boutique. And, and we're not going to be selling kids toys there as well. Um, so I think I, and my, my personal opinion is, I think that's a good direction, because especially if you want to mainstream thrifting, um, secondhand reuse as a mainstream consumer phenomenon. I, I think people will feel more comfortable with that. Thank you. Well, that's all from my side uh, regarding questions. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks a lot. The only last little point I wanted to, to mention, maybe we can somehow share uh, a, a teaser with the with the audience after the event is that uh, there was a beautiful uh, series which was filmed about the the lives and activities of people active in social enterprises in the in the Netherlands so similar to goodwill in in the in the US which was aired during Christmas time at prime time and uh, it was really um, very very well done about the connection between the people and the goods which they're selling and the whole story behind reuse and the importance of donations so on and so forth. And it was a little bit going into the kind of inspiration in the media about how you can really kind of inspire kind of reuse culture. So I'll, I'll share that a little later. Yeah. I can see our colleagues from the Netherlands are there as well. But um, I would just like to simply ha really wholeheartedly thank you, Adam, for, for oh. your time. I know it's been a whirlwind of a conversation. You know, we've we've gone from from uh, from mexico to ghana to <laughs> to 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 everywhere i love it i love conversation. it but um and i guess we could go on for another six hours if uh, if we could um but unfortunately it's not possible but i would like to really really thank you and of course the attendees have been so so active i think it's absolutely fantastic and it's really really appreciated i would like to take this opportunity as well to mention that this is part of a three-part series where we um, we are exploring this idea of social value in the circular economy. Uh, our next two speakers will um, put their views on the topic. The first will be Lakshmi Narayan from Pune in India. Uh, Lakshmi has been at the forefront of creating uh, cooperatives of waste pickers, really working with the most vulnerable uh, in India and also creating the first trade union of waste pickers in India. So I think it's gonna be a fantastically interesting conversation with her. So please do join for that. And then in uh, October uh, time, we have recently had um, the confirmation that uh, the European Commissioner for the Environment, uh, Virginia uh, Sinkovicius, 
will be joining us also for one of these conversations. So please do join for that. But Adam, you've really got the ball rolling with some fantastic ideas. And we'll be summarizing these ideas and creating a little report at the end to try and you know create a snowball effect and pushing this idea for forward about social value and the circular economy. So I will let you go to your next uh, meeting. We will keep in touch for sure. Please. Um, and just on behalf of Reuse on my team, thanks so much. And Kelly, thanks for everything uh, for your fantastic organization. So Thank all you. the best to everyone. And Thank have you, a everyone. great day wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you so much. Ciao.